had ever seen. She was scared. She was drooling because she couldn't close her mouth. Uh, she was skinny because she wouldn't, wasn't able to eat properly. She was sleeping with her eyes open. But Zubeda still insists on shaking hands with all of her medical team. Dr. Grossman and his team plot a series of surgeries. From a mask of pain, they must bring back the face of a little girl, a frightened little girl. Two surgeries in the first week, freeing up her neck and arm, adding skin grafts from her own back. They must use her own skin or her body will reject it. It's an extremely painful process, but they begin to see the real Zubeda, like a sculpture, developing. A little girl evolved from underneath that mask of scar tissue. When she finally saw in the mirror what she looked like, you could see a little smile on her face. And uh, that was special because that was the first time her father had seen her smile in at least a year. He turned to me. And he put his hand on his heart. We hugged, and uh, I knew how he felt. And I felt the same way. But more is at stake. Her spirit, too, is re-emerging. <laughs> the surgeries continue. Four more operations for her arm, her eyelid, her ear, and lip. After the first operation, she never cried again going to the operating room. Even while she was going through all this, she wanted to dance. I think that's what uh, kept her going, that she wanted to live. She wanted to dance. Four months have passed. Dr. Grossman and his wife, Rebecca, are becoming more attached to Zubeda, especially since after just a week, Zubeda's father had to return to Afghanistan. But without somewhere to live, Zubeda was going to have to return to Afghanistan before her treatment was finished. Dr. Grossman found that unacceptable. In an extraordinary gesture, he and his wife, Rebecca, decided to take Zubeda into their new home and become her legal guardians. Sometimes things just feel right. And you do something that you never thought you would do. The Grossmans have no children of their own. Zubeda's new home in a gated community just outside Los Angeles is as far from Zubeda's tiny village as can be imagined. In the backyard, an animal kingdom, including a horse named Botox. Dr. Grossman is, after all, a plastic surgeon. The Grossmans also send Zubeda to school for the first time in her life. But the surgeries don't end. Zubeda's 10th operation is on By her now, island. Zubeda loves Chinese food and going to the movies. In just 12 weeks at school, she's learned English. By her 11th birthday, surrounded by all her friends from school, she's celebrating American style. How do her friends see her and relate to her? You know, they think she's beautiful and they love her. And when she first started school, they were fighting over who was going to be her best friend. She is involved in all the melodrama of the third grade of who was mean to who in the, this morning and who didn't pick who for, uh, for a handball. And... Zubeda now lives the consummate suburban Southern California life. She's a born leader. And her friends want to be just like Zubeda. Dad! Surprisingly, she calls the Grossmans mommy and daddy. Oh, it's like in Finding Nemo. She wanted, it was her choice when you ask her to do that. And um, it's funny, though, because when she gets mad at me, I'm Rebecca. I once uh, went to um, a father-daughter dance. And I could see how, how proud she was to go to the dance and to have me be there with her. That just did it for me. I mean, I said to myself, she is my child. Well, she's in this country, she is my child. If the police come, I'm running. <laughs> he wasn't just your doctor, he gave you his house. Yeah. 
so nice to me, so good person. Do you love them very much? Yeah, a lot. Zubeda has had only limited contact with her family back in Afghanistan. There is no phone in their village. I miss my family a lot. Last surgery. You ready? No. See you later, alligator. Zubeda is at the end of what was always planned to be one year of treatment in America. She has had three years of surgery crammed into one, and the transformation is as much as her doctors could ever have hoped for. Do you feel like a normal girl? Yeah. Oh, let the dogs out. Ooh, 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 ooh. Do you feel pretty? I think so. Once she's had this wonderful life here, how in the world can she go back and live in a hut in Afghanistan? It's difficult. But if you came to me and said, help my child, and I agreed, and then we said, you know what? I can provide a better life for your child, so I'm not going to give her back to you. Would that be fair? No. What would you want in a perfect world? I want Peter and Rebecca there. You want Peter and Rebecca to live in Afghanistan? Mm -hmm. Let's just help you on a lot of flat ground in <laughs> Afghanistan. While Rebecca stays in Los Angeles, Dr. Grossman will take Zubeda back to her parents in Afghanistan. Letting her go will be tougher than any surgery. Oh, my little baby going home. No God bless you, okay? Oh, Time has come. <sighs> and I don't want you to be scared on the airplane either. I want you to brush your teeth every day, even if nobody else there brushes your teeth. And I want you to do great things when you grow up. So they Can we all three give a good hug? I love you. Bye. all in one year, not to mention countless choruses of who let the dogs out. Zabeda has healed. But now it's time for her to leave the life of a privileged American third grader and return to a very primitive life in Afghanistan. For her American parents, Peter and Rebecca, it's a difficult goodbye, harder than any surgery. Once again, John Quinones. last few days that I'm going to see her for, for who knows when. Um, it, it, it's very difficult for me. After 34 hours of travel from Los Angeles, Dr. Peter Grossman and Zubeda finally arrive in Kabul. And if this is the big city, I don't know what to expect in, uh, in Zubeda's town. Yeah, he is really sad. I love the house, bro. Dr. Grossman meets with Afghan aid workers to try to get a school built for Zubeda's village. She's going back to a life of no electricity, no phone, not even mail. You know what happened to me, Mary, when you were 13? What? I come over and I kick your butt. No. Wearing lowriders and cowboy boots, Zubeda is almost certainly the only Afghan girl carrying a Game Boy in her purse. Okay, one, two, three. Yeah. <clears throat> <laughs> but if your mommy says you have to go back in your Afghan clothes, you got to go back in your Afghan clothes. I'm not having any. I don't have any. I'm not from Afghanistan. Uh -huh. I'm, I'm from America. Yeah. Oh. Dr. Grossman Where's and Dr. Grossman has flown Zubeda's parents into Kabul from their remote village. Zubeda hasn't seen them in over a year, and seconds before their reunion, Zubeda's face is hard to read. They have no idea what she looks like today. Happy baby? Yeah. <laughs> Can't ask for anything more than, than, than the look of love in their eyes and, and how happy they are to see her. It's priceless. Priceless. But she's, she's done very good. Now, 
Initially, I could, I felt a little pushed out, and yet very quickly, as I saw the love that she had for her parents and the love that the parents had for her, all these feelings that I had that perhaps I was leaving her in a place that she shouldn't be, that, uh, all of those went away. Where my daddy? As Zubeda leaves with her parents, confusion at the airport. Peter Grossman has just a few precious seconds to say goodbye. I love you, baby. I love you, too. Thank you. See you, Peter. Good luck. They fly their separate ways. And then for Zubeda, another seven-hour journey to her home in the desert. In the 110 degree heat, her extended family, who make up the entire village, finally get their first glimpse of Zubeda. <laughs> Zubeda shows our cameras her home. This is my house. Let's see my house. This house my sister. Oh, Zubeda has one last request, that we shoot this video introducing her family to the Grossmans. Hi, Peter, Rebecca, this is my family. Hi, Peter, Rebecca, see you later, I love you. You gave her her smile back. I think it was always there, we just needed to unmask it. The Grossmans are in touch with Zubeda once a week, calling on a programmed satellite phone that they gave her. She tells them she's happy and that her brother takes her to a school on his bike quite a ways from their home. And when she grows up, she wants to be a doctor. You can find out how to help Zubeda, her school, and her family by going to our website at abcnews.com. We'll be right back. is a Himalayan kingdom tucked between China and India. A seemingly magical place that has for centuries secluded itself from the rest of the world. A place with no traffic lights and no fast food chains. A country with more monks than soldiers, where it's law to wear traditional dress in public places. This tiny country of less than a million people has guarded its culture from outside influence. People who come here to Bhutan, they all fall in love with Bhutan. Why? Because we have a beautiful country, we have a rich tradition, rich culture, unspoiled. People who travel to Bhutan, I cannot believe that there is a country still left in the world which is almost untouched. And time and again, they've always told me, they said, don't bring television into the country. Oh, shoo, shoo, shoo. Cable is thin. But in June 1999, Bhutan did bring television into the country. After years of cultural protectionism, TV was legalized by royal decree. The last place on earth to hook up to the box. We found the man who the Bhutanese called the cable guy, Rinzi Dorji. Just a few years ago, he hardly knew how a television worked. 
I thought, uh, how is it possible that pictures were just coming out there without any uh, tape being played there? Then, uh, of course, uh, I tried to find out how it was coming and this, that. Uh, then I said, it's just a wonderful technology that broadcasting from somewhere else and that you, everybody could see on the television set. <laughs> We watched Rinzi wiring up homes every day. 45 channels for just $5 a month. Everything from the BBC to Baywatch. All for the same price as a bag of dried red chilies. But not everyone welcomes the new entrepreneurs. You want to know the real reason I'm here? Well, These are business people. These are not even technicians. These are business people who want to sell. And they will broadcast, they will show anything they want. But as a cable operator, I can't uh, selectively give programs because the demand is such that some parents would like to have some programs which are not good for others. Rinzi invited us to his family home. In the backyard, five satellite dishes receive signals from all over the world. Beneath the living room, racks of receivers and decks have taken the place of traditional livestock. The family home has become central control. This, with this uh, setting that we have at the moment is good for 33 channels. Once we go on expanding, uh, then we would require more space and more equipment and more racks. But Rinzi's mother-in-law was skeptical. I think uh, people have suddenly realized that uh, there are so many things uh, that they desire which they were not even aware of before. And the truth is that uh, most of these uh, uh, television channels are commercially driven. And uh, so uh, the Bhutanese people are, yes, uh, driven towards um, consumerism. That's inevitable. And that's, to some extent, unfortunate, but inevitable. When I come home from school, I change my clothes and go straight to the TV room and watch television. Uh, I watch Cartoon Network and check if there is wrestling in Star Sports. Uh, when it's my exam time, I, I could not study because of thinking about the cart cartoon characters and the superstars of the wrestling. Hey, that's pretty good. Nemo <laughs> Television introduced only last year. Everybody, as one thing, is curious to see what is happening. They have never seen the special monkey, and they have never seen the television in their life. So they're curious, you know, very much curious to know what is that. I noticed that the last week when I was uh, with my brother and watching uh, television, so sometimes I forget my prayer things like, you know, so sometimes they're disturbing this, this kind of TV. So I thought maybe uh, better not to have myself. Soon after television started, we started getting letters to the editor for the newspaper from children. Children who seemed very hurt. The letters actually specifically asked 
uh, about this World Wrestling Federation program. Why are these big men standing there hitting each other? I mean, what's the purpose of it? They didn't understand. They were very hurt. Now, a few months later, one morning, I mean, a personal example, uh, one of my sons, seven years old, jumped on me uh, early in the morning on, on the bed, and he says, hey, I'm Triple H, you can be Rock, and we're fighting. Suddenly, they were, these were new heroes for our children. The government uh, has requested the cable operators that they should, to the extent possible, uh, exercise discretion on their part. But it's easier said than done. You know, with, with, with all these satellite dishes that are available, it's just, it'll be difficult to control. And so the light of 45 channels flickers, and the Bhutanese tune in to the rest of the world. I have myself heard comments from people saying that, my God, we didn't know that we were living in such a peaceful country. There seems to be violence and crime everywhere around the world. So uh, in a way, the, the positive thing is that British people realize how good a life they are living in this country.